All right, here we go. Today we have a baseball legend in the building. Three-time World Series winner, nine-time All-Star. Daryl Strawberry, welcome to Vlad TV. Vlad TV, thank you. It's good to be with you. <laughs> long time, long, long, long time fan of you, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me on. So uh, thank you for you know being a long time fan. I appreciate that too, my brother. And I just got to say, at 62 years old, you look great. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's just living right, taking care of yourself, eating healthy. Uh, you know, of course, life has always have its challenges for everybody. And, um, you know, from a physical standpoint, mental standpoint, emotional standpoint. But I've been able to regroup and put it all back together and, and, and live that right journey and uh, wake up every day feeling healthy. I mean... Of course, I have the aches and pains from um, a long career and the physical part of it is all there. You know, the knees, the shoulders, back, you know, you go through that whole process. Well, yeah, man, we should all be so lucky to be 62 years old, to look as great as you, in shape, great skin. You know, I'm telling you, man, congratulations, because as we get older, it's very important to take care of ourselves. And you've definitely done it. It is. It truly is important for us to take better care of ourselves, you know, as we get older. Because you, when you're young, you know, you're very vulnerable and you don't have to worry about a lot of different things. And, and so when you get up in age, you start looking and you look in the mirror, it's like, oh, crap, man. You know, I better keep myself together here. You know, I'm getting a little heavy here and there. I just remember a few years back, you know, it got a little heavy. You know, when I first moved to St. Louis, you know, they feed all that heavy food and kind of blows you up. And I was like, this is not going to work, you know. And I was out of breath a lot playing golf and stuff. And couldn't tie my shoe half the time, breathing hard. So I, I realized that, you know, I had to cut back on some of the heavy eating. Yep. Well, congratulations on turning it all around. <laughs> well, it's your first time here. I want to start in the very, very beginning. Uh, so you grew up in Crenshaw. I did. I grew up in Southern California, uh, South Central. Uh, went to Crenshaw High. You know, a lot of people come to California these days and proclaim that they uh, grew up and know about Crenshaw High and, and, and growing up in, in those neighborhoods. But I actually grew up in those neighborhoods and had to walk to school every day. Um, you know, grew up a, around the gang ac activity that was all around us and everything. And, then, you know, it was a really decision and choice that you have to make in those neighborhoods. Uh, do you hit the streets or uh, do you go to school and you participate in what school has for you and the opportunity? So... I made a decision, a conscious decision, you know, to go to school. Uh, you know, I had a lot of friends that went the other way and went to the streets and gangs and everything. Uh, most of them are probably not living today because of that choice. Uh, but I had the same choice, but I, I went to school and I wanted to play sports, you know, and I got involved with a lot of sports in high school, you know, baseball, football, and basketball. I tried a little bit of everything. And uh, it just kept me solid, kept me in a solid foundation and kept me in a direction that I needed to go in to stay focused if I really wanted to do something, if I really wanted to get out of the neighborhood. I mean, there's a ticket out of the neighborhood and it was always about school and sports to get out because most of the time when you grow up in the ghetto, it's not like that. You know, the challenges are, are real. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. And they think, well, people come from those places are just bad people. No, they're not bad people. You know, it's the environment that we grow up in. And, and, and we learn the habits from growing up in that environment and, and you become a part of it or you decide to make a decision uh, to do something else for yourself. Well, you talked about in your book in the 70s that, you know, you were growing up in, in Crenshaw, but it wasn't like boys in the hood Crenshaw. You know, you said everyone's mom and dad were working. All the kids went to school. You know, there was some drugs and violence, but not really where you lived. Well, it hadn't really increased until after I got a little bit older. Um, and I think that's when the violence started to come. I think that's when, you know, the gangs from each side started to, you know, have this feud towards each other, you know, and the, and the challenges towards each other. And, and it's unfortunate, you know, because, you know, I always think about it. It's just, it's just a black on black crime, you know, and we don't really ever talk about the importance of who we are as people and, you know, we have our young people that come against each other and fight against each other. And you wish, you know, a lot of them would go in this different directions and learn to come together and believe in each other because the gift, the gifts that they have down inside of them down there, so many of them, they got so many talents and gifts that they can use. And I think you don't really 
realize that until you actually step away from a lot of that stuff, and, which is hard, which is hard to do. Don't get me wrong, everybody think it's just an easy journey and you're able to just step away from it. And that is not true. It's a very hard thing for young kids up the age of 14, 15 years old to make a decision uh, which road that they're gonna take. Well, your parents had five kids and all of them were born like a year apart. So, so your mom was like pregnant for like five years straight. She was, and she was a beautiful lady. Um, I'm grateful for her. I didn't really have a father. I had a mom raise five of us. You know, my dad was an alcoholic. Came home for the last time when I was about 14 years old. Put out a shotgun, drunk again, said he was gonna kill the whole family. So um, we had to experience a lot of that night after night of the craziness of my father coming into the house. and. We made a decision that night that this would be it. That was the final night, you know, he would come in and act like that because me and my brothers went into action. Uh, my brother Ronnie grabbed a butcher knife, I grabbed a frying pan. And it was just one of those things growing up like that, knowing that our father really wasn't a father figure. You know, he was a man that beat us and, and really made us feel like we, we were nothing. And we just got to that point on that last night and had it not been for my mother getting me and my brothers out of the house, we would have killed him tonight. And I always tell people it could have been a tragedy in my life before I ever put a baseball uniform on. And I always tell them, yeah, that my pain led me to my greatness because your pain can lead you to your greatness. But your greatness would eventually lead you to your destructive behavior when you not well. Brokenness is real. And it just continues to bring a broken generation of people until someone gets healed on the inside. Healing has to take place on the inside. And for a very long time, I was never healed. Uh, I just experienced a life, you know, of, of, of being a young teenager growing up and feeling, you know, rejected and feeling empty on the inside and, and really knowing that my mother was the, uh, the queen of the Strawberries family, that she raised five of us by herself. And she did a remarkable job. Don't get me wrong. She did not raise me to live a heathen lifestyle. She raised me as a good kid, with good principles, because I just you remember, I used to come in that house with my baseball cap on and I thought I was so cool. And my mother would turn and look at me like, and I'd be like, what? She'd be looking at me, she'd be like, you better take that cap off your head before I knock it off your head in this house. So that I was raised right by my mother, uh, but as I got older in life, you know, I decided, you know, I wanted to make my own decisions. And there's a price to pay for, you know, own decisions. I always say that, you know, uh, everybody, always think because you make it to the top that you should be okay. Uh, that's not really the case. You know, the, the brokenness of a life is real. And so many young people experience that in their life uh, growing up in neighborhoods like I did, you know, just all across the country, you know, young African-American kids, they grow up with the struggle of not having two parents in the home. Some have to live with their grandparents. And it's unfortunate circumstances that it happens so much in our communities. Uh, and I was a part of it. I was no different. I think people look at you and think you're different because you made it to the top. You make, making it to the top doesn't make you different than anybody from those neighborhoods you grew up in. Uh, you just really eventually made a better decision for yourself to go in a different direction. Well, yeah, you talked about this in your book. You, know, you said your dad was an alcoholic. He would beat your mom on a regular basis. He would beat the kids. And then the showdown that you talked about where your dad pulled out a shotgun, you know, you guys pulled out skillets and uh, baseball bats and a butcher knife and a skillet and a frying pan. But then the police showed up. And the police basically told your dad he should go. And was that when he left and never came back? Well, I, that was kind of the end of it for my mother. Because I think she realized one thing that um, he had put her kids and her boys, I'm talking about me and my two brothers, in a really bad situation. You know, that could have ended it very poorly. Um, and I think she realized that once you have involved the boys like that, she knew that you could no longer come back to the house, you know, cause you put them in a situation where they, they started to, they responded, you know, we responded. You're talking about 14, 15, 16. You, you're talking about could have been life over, you know, cause you know, inside of us, you know, from the beatings and everything and who he was an alcoholic, uh, we just felt like we just didn't want to deal with this anymore. And and, and it could have ended up in a, 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 a bad situation all the way around for all of us. 
Well, so now you have a single mom with five kids uh, living in South Central. And you yourself, you were about, what, 10 years old when you started realizing that you were like a, a gifted athlete? Yeah, when I was young, I realized that. But I didn't have any structure because I didn't have a male figure around to support me, to encourage me. Uh, my father never came to my games or, you know, never put me in Little League when I was 10. You know, I didn't start playing. I didn't really start playing baseball until he was after out of the house, you know. So that was around 14. That's when I started playing and got involved you know, with some friends that I went to school with. And they took me to a park called Rancho Park. Uh, to go and, and probably sign up to play. And one of the coaches saw me there and I, I threw a pitch to him and he said, throw to me. And I threw a fastball to him and threw a curveball. And he saw me throw a curveball and he told the other guys, well, you go hide him out because he's going to play on our team. <laughs> so that's how I really got involved with playing baseball, you know, the start of playing baseball uh, because of the coach. Um, and then I would continue to go forward uh, you know, after that, after my father was nowhere around and, and, and didn't help out. You know, mom bought me cliques. Mom bought me a glove. And it was just like, she said, if you want to play, well, go ahead. And she allowed me to go play. But because my father wasn't allowing us to play when we were that age. So we, we, we just struggled at a younger age trying to figure out, you know, who are we? What are we? What is, what is this life all about? Right. And the kids used to call you straw dog early on because you were just dogging people out. <laughs> Well, they did. You know, they got they gave me the nickname Straw Dog, you know, because I would, you know, I play against a lot of good teams in that little league at Rancho Park. And you know, I was young left-hander and I would just dog them out when I got on the mound. But also at the plate, you know, when I was facing other good guys, you know, that uh, were from the same neighborhood. And, and I was just taking them deep, taking them to the next diamond, you know, because the ballparks were open. You didn't have a fence around the ballpark. You know, the ballparks were wide open. It was a wide open opportunity. So you could hit a home run, and, but you had to run like crazy around those bases <laughs> to make sure you <laughs> make sure you make it a home run. But they would play me in so much, and I would hit it so deep, they would have to run so far after the ball. So by the time I got to the plate, you know, they were just barely getting the ball back in. So, you know, that's why they were calling me straw dog, because you just didn't let up. You didn't let up when you got on the mound. You didn't let up when you were hitting. Okay, so you played at Crenshaw for the Crenshaw High School Cougars. And a, a lot of guys from that, that high school were going pro, like straight out of high school. Well, a lot of guys from Crenshaw was going in basketball uh, before baseball was, you know, really the big thing. Um, and I say that because you have guys like Marcus Johnson, you know, um, guys like that came out of Dolan Cook. All those guys came out of Crenshaw way before I did. You know, Wendell Tyler came out before I did, out of Crenshaw, Ellis Valentine came out in baseball. So Ellis Valentine was the biggest name in baseball that came out of Crenshaw High. And it wasn't until 1979 when we had a really good team. I, I think it was a book written about the team, uh, about the Crenshaw Cougar baseball team, the best team ever in high school because we had four guys get drafted that year off our team. My third baseman, Chris Brown, got drafted by the San Francisco Giants in the second round. Our left fielder got drafted by the Giants. And our first baseman uh, was was a twin. He got drafted by the Giants, and his brother was a center fielder. He got drafted by the Yankees. So, 79, we played in the city championship at Dodger Stadium in my junior year at high school. Uh, we played against Granada Hills. We lost that championship game. We played, and the guy that played for Granada Hills was a third baseman by the name of John Elway. They beat us in the city championship at Dodger Stadium in 79. And all the scouts were asking my coach after the other players that they knew who they were. And they said, well, what about the tall um, Laker kid you got, Strawberry? He goes, he's a junior and he plays basketball. He goes, he plays basketball? They said, well, please tell him don't get hurt on the basketball court because we'll be looking at him next year because so many scouts said I reminded them. Some said Ted Williams, but a lot of scouts like George Genevieve, that was a giant scout he said I remind him myself of Willie McCovey you know who played for the San Francisco Giants was a big first baseman long lanky hit the ball a long way they said well he have a great future in baseball uh, just make sure he don't get hurt playing basketball in the senior year okay so you finish off your senior year and you know you had the option you could either go to college 
or you could go pro in baseball and you decide to actually enter the draft. Yeah, and well. And you get drafted by the Mets. Well, of course. I mean, it was the number one draft pick in the country. So I was the first pick in the draft uh, that year, 1980, out of high school. And that's over all, all the players that were getting drafted. And so I would get draft, drafted by the New York Mets. And, you know, the day of the draft was, you know, I was in class and the principal comes to get me out and saying, oh, you've been drafted and they want to talk to you over at the, um, around the baseball area where, where coach is over there about being drafted. And they got me out of class and I went over there and then they said, well, okay, you've been drafted. You got a phone call from the New York Mets and they said, you've been the number one pick. I says, okay. They says, well, <laughs> I said, okay, but I just wanted to play. And they said, we, we selected you the number one pick and we're the New York Mets and we're, we're excited about you and your future. And then, and I just thought to myself, okay, well, where the heck, where the heck is New York at? I had never been out of California. All I, I grew up in California watching the L.A. Dodgers and the Cincinnati Reds play. Uh, and most people don't understand, that's how I got involved in baseball was because of the Dodgers and the Cincinnati Reds. That's when the Reds were the big red machine. And I saw the Reds, and they had all these great players, Tony Perez and, and Johnny Bench and Joe Morgan and just so many guys, Concepcion, this guy and that guy. And then they had this one guy called Pete Rose. And, you know, I saw Pete Rose play, and I saw it. I saw his uniform and, and, and I realized that's what a baseball player is supposed to look like. That's why I wanted to play baseball because I became a big fan of Pete Rose. He was Charlie Hustle and, you know, he would dive into bases and his uniform was always dirty and he looked different than other players, you know. And I thought, man, if I'm going to play baseball, I need to look like this guy and, and I need my uniform to be dirty. Because if your uniform was clean when you was playing growing up, that means you wasn't doing anything. I mean, yeah, I just interviewed Pete Rose, man. He's a he's a real character. He's a character. That's all I say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a character, and it's a shame they won't let him in the Hall of Fame. You know, his here's a guy of his yeah. of his career and what he did on the field. You know, everybody's done something in life, but you know what what he did yeah. on the field. Nobody's ever gonna get four thousand hits. So I, I know I won't be living to see it. You know, and and that, that's right. a, that's history yeah. for for a guy like him. So yeah. No, he's still salty about that, but I don't think in his lifetime he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, no. unfortunately, because the whole gambling thing. Yeah, not as long as he's living. You know, maybe after, you know, he's he's gone. Right. You know, he might decide, you know, make the decision uh, to let him in. But um, he was he was a great player. I just tell you, that he didn't have the talent of a lot of other great players, but he had he had more hustle uh, than any player I ever seen play the game of baseball, and, and that's what really intrigued me to play baseball because of his hustle, uh, the way he hustled, the uh, way he walked. He, when, he, when he took a walk, he didn't walk. He sprinted down the first base, you know, and, and you just love that. I mean, I was like, this guy is the real deal. Well, uh, explain it to me. So you're the number one overall draft pick for the Mets, but after they draft you, they send you to the minors. Yes, they sent me to the minors. They sent me from from Crenshaw High, all black community school, uh, to Lynchburg, Virginia. Well, no, not, not Lynchburg, Virginia. Let me go wrong. I'm going to get ahead of that. Kingsport, Tennessee. That was my first stop in my rookie year. Kingsport, Tennessee. In the middle of nowhere. I was culture shocked, you know, from coming from Crenshaw High and where we came from. And of course, we played other schools. There were white schools and everything that we played against, you know, like Palisades High and Venice High, Westchester. But our school was African-American school and we had a white coach. And um, so I really never was exposed to going anywhere like I was until I went to Kingsport, Tennessee. And I just thought to myself, oh, my God, Mom. I called my mom every night and just cried about coming home. And She's like, no, this is the decision you made because I had a choice to go to Oklahoma State to play basketball and baseball, but I was the number one pick, so I signed with the Mets, and I ended up in Kingsport, Tennessee to kick off my career. Okay, so you start off in the minors, and then in 83, at age 21, that's when you actually go into the majors. Yeah, that's when I actually uh, get to the major leagues. After 81... You know, 81 year, I was in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, and I came close to quitting after that year. And the organization said, give it another year. Because I thought I might have made a wrong decision. And I gave it another year. And I went to Jackson, Mississippi in the Texas League. 
and I hit 34 home runs and stole 45 bases, and that's when I realized I became a ball player. Um, I realized that I had something and I might have a chance. And then I went to AAA the next year, 1983. I started off the first month in AAA, and then the team got off to a bad start, and they brought me up to the big leagues in 1983 at the age of 21 years old. Right, and you had a, a hell of a year. Like you said, 26 home runs, seven triples, 74 runs batted in, 257 average, and you became the National League's Rookie of the Year. Yeah, but I got to tell you about this. You know, I wouldn't have never became the National League Rookie of the Year had it not been for my coach, Jim Fry, because I was supposed to be at the ballpark. I got off to a rough start, and I was supposed to be at the ballpark at 1 o'clock, and I didn't show up to 3 o'clock. So my hitting coach, Jim Fry, got up in my face when I got to the park, and he looked me right in the eyes, and he was this little guy, and he said, if you ever want to be a great Major League Baseball player, you'll be at this ballpark every day early. He goes, I'm not going to ever wait for you again. And that was a really turning point in my career right there. That's when I realized more than anything how important coaches are. That's when you start to understand it's not about your talent. It's not about who, how great you are and how great you can be. It's about how you're really going to proceed yourself to be what kind of player you're going to be either either you're going to allow coaches to help you go this way or you're not going to pay attention to them and listen to them and your career will go that way. So, so many guys had great potentials, great talent, but they never listened to anybody. And I think that's what's the difference in my self sitting here today was listening to Jim Fry and that kicked me off to go forward. So every coach that came along had a big impact in how my career was going to go of moving forward. So I'm forever thankful for so many different guys like Jim Fry, uh, Bill Robinson, my hitting coach, Davey Johnson, manager coach, uh, just so many different people. Bobby Valentine was a third base coach, Bud Harrelson. It's just so many people that had a, a, a big part of what helped me get to where I needed to get as a player. Because you, you can have the talent, but if you don't have the extra kick, the extra go, you cannot reach that other place. It's a different level uh, of places where players, certain players can go that some will stay at one level, but in, any, in all sports, but then some can get to that next level and that's that great level of playing. And when you can arrive like that, it's because of everybody that's had an impact on your life gro uh, going through that process. Well, that rookie year, you actually got into it with some of your teammates on picture day uh, with the team captain, uh, Keith Hernandez. Well, that wasn't into that a physical year. Altercation. <laughs> that wasn't. Oh, a, was that the next year? That was no. That was I think. I think that was later in the later in my career. You know, picture day with Keith Hernandez. You know, I think it was in, it was oh, in the okay. middle of me negotiating my contract, talking about my contract in 1989, I believe, at picture day. Uh, one of those, yeah, one one of those years, um, and. Um, Come to find out he had said something to the media about I didn't need to be talking about my contract situation. And the media came back and told me, so I confronted him about it. I said, it's none of your business. I told him, it's none of your business, you know, about my contract. I, I said, I never got into your business about your contract negotiation. And he was talking about, well, I didn't need to be focused on negotiating a contract or anything because I had one more year left. And after the year, if I wasn't going to sign, I was going to become a free agent. So... He, he, he went down the wrong road talking about somebody else's contract and negotiation and what they should be doing and how much they should be getting. And because I never did that for uh, uh, towards any player. Um, that's his business. He's got to feed his family. So and he kept mouthing off at pitcher day. So I, I just rushed him, you know, and I was like, dude, I, you, you have no idea where I'm from. I'm from the streets. And, you know, I might have this baseball uniform on, but I'm a street guy. I grew up in the streets and everything. And when somebody's got something to say, look, we. We're used to throwing these up, putting these up and, and, and getting down. And so, you know, I rushed him in picture day and, 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 you know, all the guys knew I was about to do it, teammates and stuff. So they, they ran in and beeline me to cut me off, you know, and, you know, so I wouldn't really get to him. But, um, you know, we made up after that because we teammates, you know, it's, it's going to always be some hit in-house stuff going on. It's just a matter of can you just squash it and move on and, and get down to business and take care of your business as a team and do what you got to do. Well, during that altercation, didn't you say that you'll bust that little redneck in the face? No, that was Wally Backman. That was my second baseman. He was chirping off in the. Oh, okay. He was chirping off to the press about me too, and um, and they came 
Uh, they came to me once again to tell me, and they said, well, you know who it was. Who, who's always chirping? Who's always talking? I said, Wally. They goes, there it is. They said, I didn't want to say it, but I already know. And <laughs> I mean, you live with these guys for like eight months out of the year. You know who's who and everything. And so, uh, man, he chirped off in the media t about me too one day, and, and, I, and I told them, you know, I'll, I'll bust him in the face, you know, if, if he really want if he really want to feel that, you know. But, you know, like I said, we moved on from that, you know, we squashed that. It, it, it's part of, like I said, what happens when you play sports. Okay, so that next year, 84, that's when the Mets really started to, you know, get the team together and really started the whole empire that, you know, stretched from 84 to 90. And, uh, you know, where they were, basically finishing first or second in the division every year. And you actually made your first All-Star game that year. I did. 84 was uh, after my rookie rookie year in 83, winning rookie of the year. Went into 84, and, and we got off to uh, a really good place in 84 uh, because Davey Johnson had came in and took over as the manager. Because when I got there in 83 and won rookie of the year, I was playing with a bunch of veteran players that were done. Seaver was there a bunch of other old veteran players that were done and they didn't really care about winning. It was a business to them. And you understand, I didn't understand that at the time. And we was not the Mets, we were the mutts, you know, cause we were just getting whooped all the time and we're in last place and nobody cared. And we only had a few young guys like myself, Hubie Brooks and Mookie Wilson. But 84 was really a good year because Davey Johnson came in and took over as manager. And then we had this young phenom, phenom pitcher of the name by, Doc Gooden, you know, who came up right behind me, and he was 19 years old when he came up in 84. And he would go on to win Rookie of the Year. We went back-to-back -back Rookie of the Years. So now we're headed in the right direction uh, for the organization. Um, they're moving in a place where we got young players, we got some blended veteran players coming in. Now we're starting to make some noise. And 84, we made some noise. Uh, we lost that year, we came close. We lost that year to the Chicago Cubs. I think the only reason we lost because Rick Sutcliffe came over in the trade for the Cubs and he went 16 and one. So had had we not had to deal with Sutcliffe going 16 and one, we'd have might have won in 84. So 84 was a really good year for going into to 85 for us that next season. Right, I mean, you were in the All-Star game that year and then eight consecutive appearances after that, five, as a starter. So you were really becoming, you know, one of the, the big guys in baseball at this point. Uh, how did that really feel coming from where you came from? And now you're one of the big dogs in, in baseball. Well, I think it was a dream really for me that I always believed in. And I, I, I just thought to myself growing up, me and Eric Davis, who grew up together, we just dreamed about being in the big leagues together and not just being a player in the big leagues. We, we dreamed about being a star in the big leagues and, and making all-star games and, and winning championships and you know doing great things. Uh, that was part of our makeup. Uh, our drive, you know, when we was like 18 years old was to be that. And, and there it was, I had reached that point in 84 making an all-star game and going on, continue to make all-star games. And then, you know, playing in my first World Series in 1986, and I was 24 years old at that time. And people try to make it like we're gonna do that all the time because that was supposed to happen because you had such a great team and it just doesn't happen like that every year. You can have the best team. You can spend all the money you want on the team. It does not guarantee you gonna win. You know, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. You know, you have to have the right chemistry. Everything has to go the right way. And I think in those years, as we started to go forward, Everything went the right way for us uh, in that 86 year, you know, after the 85 season, because we were bitter. We lost in 85 to the Cardinals. Uh, they, we won 98 games and the Cardinals beat us out that year. And the Cardinals, we, we could not stand the Cardinals. We hated the Cardinals. You know, <laughs> I know I live here in St. Louis and they know that too, but we just did not like the Cardinals. It wasn't, I mean, we like certain guys. I like Willie McGee. Willie was a, the best guy on the Cardinals that we liked, you know. But the rest of them we thought were a bunch of jerk offs, you know, and you know, you know, Ozzy was great too, you know, and we, we just played hard against the Cardinals, but you know, they beat us in 85 and you know, they had, had some big home runs, you know, Whitey Herzog was a manager. They didn't have a lot of home run hitters, 
but they had speed, man, and they would run you to death when you play at Bush Stadium on that AstroTurf. And, you know, that year we just couldn't catch them. And, and, and they, won, they went on and won that year and beat, beat us in that division. And so there was, it sparked up a real rivalry with us and the Cardinals. And, and we would come back that next year, that 86 year, and we just dominated against the Cardinals and everybody else. Okay, so how did it feel not only to, to go to the World Series, in 86, but actually beat the Red Sox four to three, your first World Series win. Well, that felt great. I mean, I think winning that year was important to us after 85 to be able to win that division. Because you got to remember back then you had to win the division to get into the playoffs. And we get into the playoffs and we play the Astros in that series. And it was a tough series. We couldn't beat Mike Scott to save our life. Uh, but we had to beat Nolan Ryan and we had to beat Nepper and we beat those guys and we were going to win that series uh, playing against the Astros. So we get to the World Series, you know, and then we lose the first two games at home. We go down 0-2. So everybody goes, what's wrong with the match? Um, they've had this great year and now they get to the championship game and, and they, they faded, they choked out. And I think we just, I think we were just overly tired from that's serious in the, in the championship series against the Astros. And the Red Sox just got us, you know, the first two games. So we go down to Boston, get ready to play there. And Davey Johnson gives us the whole day off, which you're not supposed to have when you have a, a championship series. You're supposed to be at the ballpark and workouts for the media. He goes, we're not coming to the ballpark. They said they were going to find us for not coming to the ballpark. He says, well, you just find us. And we came out the next day and played the game. And, Man, we had a great game. Lenny Dykstra got off a good start for us, home run. Gary Carter hit some big home runs in that series, and that really brought us back, and we walked out of there back uh, back even by the time we left there and going back to Shea, and we had two games left at home. And when we got at home, we got to that game seven, uh, game six. We were, we were down and out, and everybody thought it was over. And that, that team was so good because nobody ever wanted to make the last out. During the course of the regular season, we were just like that. We didn't want to make the last out. So they carried it into that game. And, you know, Carter, I, I believe Carter was the first one that got up and got a base hit, then Mitch, then Ray Knight, and then all of a sudden, you know, things started to unfold, you know, because Boston, they had put on the board celebrating the Red Sox, as, you know, as the, as the champs. And then we just came back, and then we tied that game up with a wild pitch, you know, from Stanley, and then the ground ball to Buckner, you know, which behind the bag, you know, you hear that call from Vince Scully every time. And he misses the ball, and Mookie scores, and we win that game. But what people don't realize is we had to come back in game seven, too. We were down in game seven, and we had to come back. And we came from behind in game seven, and we would go on to win that series. But, you know, they, I mean, they crucified Bill Buckner. You know, he couldn't even go back into Boston. They, 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 they wanted to kill him and kill his family. And the poor guy, and, he, and Billy Buckner was a great player. You know, this guy almost had 3,000 hits. That was a great player, and at one play, they wanted to blame him for that, and they never blamed anybody else for it. They never blamed Clemens coming out of the game. They never blamed about Sherardi never getting anybody out, and Stanley getting nobody out. They just blamed Billy Buckner for that one play, and, and I felt so bad for him all those years because he was, he was really a great guy, and I, I think a lot of people uh, didn't understand that in Boston. You know, they didn't care. It's Boston. You know, I'm, Boston, is, Boston and Philly are the most difficult places to play. <laughs> Boston fans and Philly fans, oh my God, there's nothing like those fans. Okay, so you win the World Series, then 87, you had another big year. Uh, 39 home runs and 36 stolen bases. So you joined the 30-30 club, which at the time there's only 10 players that was in that club. No, that was really cool to be able to do that. Uh, th that was something very hard to do. It's not very easy to do. I mean, because what most people don't look at, you look at a lot of guys, a lot, a lot of smaller guys who do a lot of running. And, and I think over my career, you know, I think people underestimated that, that I used to steal a lot of bases. And that was a big part of, of, of who I was, you know, being 6'5 and could be able to run. Um, running was more important to me than hitting the home runs. You know, I always knew I could hit home runs because somebody, I always look at pitchers, you know, I said, they're very dumb. You know, they're going to always challenge you and think they can get the ball by you, or they're going to leave one up in the zone for you, and you just crush it. But being able to steal bases and go 30-30, I, I think that was a really phenomenal year to be able to do that. Um, 
you know, I could have had a back-to-back -back year. I only stole 29 the next year, but I hit 30-something home runs. And that's hard to do, you know. It's just not not easy because physically, you know, I'm I'm 6'5", you know, you're talking about at the time being about 220, you know, you, you're you going to start slowing down, you know, because it's just part of what happens, you know, when you play baseball and you play at the highest level like that. So I was able to play at that high level for a very long time, and I'm grateful for that. Well, I mean, despite having a great year, uh, the Mets ended up missing the playoffs that year. The next year, 88, 39 home runs again. And you guys get to the playoffs, but then you lose to the Dodgers. Oh, my God. Do you have to remind me of that one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely there was a heartbreaking year for us because 88 team was more talented than 86 team. But the 88 team didn't have the heart of the 86 team. The 86 team always knew we could come back and win. You know, we had guys like Ray Knight, Kevin Mitchell, and all these different guys. But the 88 team didn't have that. You had uh, uh, blended in with some, some of the younger players that had never experienced, you know, what it's like to be in playoff pressure and understand that. And we ended up having a great series against the Dodgers during that regular season. We killed them. But they came in hot during the playoffs, um, and they rolled it right out. You know, they rolled it right out. They took us to game seven. You know, Sosha hit a big home run off of Dock at Shea Stadium, two-run homer to tie that game up or something like that. And they go on to win that ball game. And, you know, that series could have been over a long time ago, but it just never happened. And, you know, we had to go seven games with them at Dodger Stadium. We would end up losing game seven there. Most heartbreaking series in to my career to this day, most heartbreaking series I ever played in my life was to go game seven and lose game seven at Dodger Stadium. Uh, growing up in California, it was just, it was so hard for me, you know, to be able to accept that. And sometimes to this day, I still don't accept it. The only reason I accept it, I can tell you the only reason I, I accept it is because they went on and they swept the Oakland A's in that, <laughs> in that, in that, in that championship series, you know, and that really made it a lot easier for me to accept. But the Dodgers really, uh, that year, it was their year to win it all, and they did. You know, and I, I can only see Lasorda how he was, yeah. I remember his little, his little thing in the locker room when they won the series. Yeah, we beat the mighty Mets, yeah. And then we beat the mighty Oakland, yeah. And he was just, he was kind of putting it all back in our face, you know, that we were mighty, but they beat us. and. Hey, they did. They they beat they beat us and they beat that A's team and that was pretty remarkable. You know, Gibson hit that big home run. You know, and and, and game one I believe it was at Dodger Stadium that took the Dodgers and just took off and led them. Oh, that that grand slam he hit off of Eckersley, uh, just took them and they just kept running and it was their year. So they they got it. Well, 1989 rolls around. Now I believe four years earlier you had gotten married, you had two kids. And you end up having a one-night stand uh, with a woman named Lisa Clayton. And then a few months later, you get hit with a paternity suit. Now, why did she hit you with a paternity suit as opposed to just reaching out privately, you know, knowing that you were married and say, hey, I got a kid. Let's just work this out behind the scenes as opposed to going public with it. I, I, it was just one of those things, you know. Um, like I said, um, it was just a one night. And it was here in St. Louis, where I live now. So... Uh, and, and it happened, you know, and one night late getting in and, and she's been around the ballpark many times, you know, trying to flag me down, never paid her no attention, you know, I'd come to the ballpark, she have a shirt on with number 18 on the back, strawberry, and, you know, just one night, you know, it just happened and i never seen her again after that. And next thing I know, it was like, she was pregnant and she had a kid. And, you know, and I, it's an unfortunate situation that happens. And I, I never even got a chance to meet the kid. And I know it's never his fault. You know, it, was, it, it, it had nothing to do with him. You know, it, it always had to do with, it was, all, it was about money, you know, getting money and stuff like that. And, and that's what it was. And I had to put trust, you know, I didn't really give the money directly to her when, when I found out that, you know, the kid was mine. I put it in trust for him so he would have. And eventually he would have it somewhere down the line. And, and that did happen for him. So I'm glad that gift was for him. Um, you know, it was unfortunate that, you know, it was all 
all built up from her and attorneys on the other side just to get money out of me in some kind of way. And and um, it, 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 it's one of those things, you, you know, you, you're young and you never think they're going to happen. And, and, and it does happen. It's a real reality. It's, it's heartbreaking. It crushed my first marriage. It, it made my first marriage in limbo and destroyed that, you know, going through that. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, I know, I know now today, but I didn't know at the time. You can pick your sins, but you cannot pick your consequences. <laughs> that's a real reality. You know, that's, that's a great statement. You can pick your sins, but you can't pick your consequences. You cannot okay. pick them because they, they're going to come yeah. somewhere. And, right. and no one, everybody thinks they're getting away with it, but you, you, you eventually don't. They end up catching up with you. And, and that was part of me picking my, my sins, you know, and the consequences come. So you have to pay a price for it. So to this day, you've never met your son? I've never met, I've never met him. No, to this day. Really? Yeah. Why not just reach out and just, you know, I, hey, did. Listen, I, tried I, know, I know I was wrong all this time, but now I'm trying to do right. I tried a couple of times, you know, when I, when I reached out to him before, I tried a couple of times. I think um, I talked to a couple of his family members, aunties or something like that. And they gave me his number. I tried to reach out and he didn't, he didn't, re he didn't respond. So I didn't want to put any pressure uh, on him uh, to make it like he needed to re respond to me because that wouldn't be right. So, but I'm still here and I still believe one day it will happen. Um, I, I, I surely hope it does, you know, because uh, he's probably a great kid and, you know, he's probably been through a lot and, you know, I think he's reached out to my manager a couple of times and I tried to reach out, but we just have not been able to, you know, coordinate that. And, and hopefully before I leave here, this earth here, you know, hopefully we'll be able to coordinate that and I'll be able to meet him. Well, uh, what's his name? His name is Michael. Well, Michael, if you're watching this, hit us up with Vlad TV. We'll connect you, man. I, think it, I understand there might be some bad feelings along the way, but this is your dad, you know, and half of your DNA comes from him. So, you know, I understand that there's anger and, you know, your mom probably said a few things and so forth, but, you know, time heals all and, you know, reach out to, to Vlad TV. We'll put you in contact. Hopefully we could be, you know, the ones that do it. So you were trying not to tell your wife that you had this, the side kid, but then when the paternity suit, suit, you know, hit the media, you had no choice. Your wife found out. Uh, how bad was that first conversation? It was a, it was a bad conversation. Um, because she didn't really get it from me. It, it, it came across the wire. And it was in the New York papers, you know, in the New York Post and the Times and all the people ran the stories. You know, a couple of writers who always you know, had some envy against players, you know, they would make sure they, they print something about you. And that was, that was part of it, playing in New York. Uh, never knowing what, you know, what, what is going to be written about you. And, and that was part of it. And that conversation after that was it was not good, you know, for a very long time. And, you know, I think it led us down the bad direction, bad direction in the marriage yeah. and, and, and headed, headed out of the marriage. Well, right, because on January 26th, 1990, you came home from a night of drinking and your wife was out as well. And a really bad situation happened next. Oh yeah, I mean, no doubt about it. I pulled a pistol on her face, you know, right. um, and um, that was an, another thing. That's the thing I was saying. I was, I said I would never be like my father, but I ended up being just like him. Right. Ended up being the same way of of who he was. And a lot of times when kids grow up and and they see that in the home, eventually it plays out in their life, and, and they end up doing the same thing. And it's not like you. It's something you want to do, but it becomes a part of who you are. And that's the reality of so many young kids that come from broken situations. Um, they end up making the same decisions. And I was no different than anybody else, but just because I had a uniform. See, I always tell people what they need to understand about having a baseball uniform on. A baseball uniform does not make you a man. It just makes you a baseball player. And I think too many people don't understand that with athletes. Putting on a uniform does, make, does not make you mad. Living behind community gates because you got millions of dollars, you got money in the bank and you drive every car, it does not make you a man. It just makes you an athlete. You know, and people need to understand that. You, don't, you know, becoming a man is a, a whole different thing in life. And I think a lot of times, a lot of us never know what that looks like. If you've never seen it in your house, 
then how do you know how to become one? You know, I never saw it in my house. I saw my father being an alcoholic, a womanizer. Guess what? I ended up being the same way, alcoholic, drug addict, womanizer, because that's all I saw. If you grow up in a household and your father's there and you got, a, you got stability in your family and it's stable, then you see that. You know, there's very few guys that will put on the uniform that will have that. I could tell you that from playing sports at the highest level, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated seven times, being winning championships and doing all these things, 95% of athletes will end up in divorce. It's only a small percentage that will end up staying with one wife and one family. M majority will end up experiencing life and all types of areas and different women in their life and end up in divorce. It's just a reality that it, that is real. You know, and people say, well, no, he's crazy about it. No, I am not crazy about it. I, I, I have played, I have seen it with my own eyes, and I've seen all, e even some of the goody-goody two-shoe players that thought they were good end up in divorce, you know, when they were playing. The only guys that i never seen end up in divorce that were real guys and that lived their real way was Gary Carter and Mookie Wilson. Two players, you know, two players that I could say that I, I saw really didn't womanize, really didn't drink, really didn't go out to the clubs, didn't go out to strip clubs. They didn't do all of that, you know, what most of us were doing. And most of us would be consumed and, and, and caught up in that is because most of us are broken and searching for something that could satisfy us on the inside because we have this career, we have success, but that doesn't really, all that doesn't satisfy you. It's just a bunch of stuff you accumulate and you have this great success doing it. Well, yeah, I mean, that was a really bad situation because you end up, you know, an argument ensues. She pulls out like a metal rod and hits you in the ribs with it. And then you pull out a gun and put it, how you described, like the roof of her nose. Yeah. And then her mom walked out and saw the whole thing so she calls the police. So once again, full circle, what happened with your dad and the shotgun and the police come and arrest you. And except as opposed to just a working guy who works for the post office, you are a baseball star that has to deal with the public consequences of this situation. So now you have to tell the Mets what happened and they have to deal with the repercussions of it. I always have to deal with it from a public perception because being a star, you know, and when, you, when you're a star, and I tell people, be careful what you ask for, people will be like, I want to be a star, and I wouldn't do what they did. You don't know what you might do. You, know? <laughs> you don't know what you'll do in those situations. You don't know what, what kind of lifestyle you have when there's no no's, when everything is a yes. You can do whatever you want to do. Um, some people, without telling you, you might have killed yourself, be, you know, just in that lifestyle, which so many celebrities will end up doing, killing themselves, drowning themselves, you know, and, and the alcohol and drugs to try to escape from, you know, the notoriety and the tension. And that's probably pretty much what I had to deal with. I had to deal with the organization. And I had to deal with the doctor, the team doctor, you know, who, who psychiatrist called me and said, I think you need to go into treatment. You got a problem with drinking. And, and, and that was my first, first trip to rehab, you know, from, from there. I didn't want to go because, you know, but I, had no choice, you know, because after pulling out a gun and putting it in my wife's face, you know, as anything can happen. Uh, so it's, it's the consequences, you know, the consequences are real. You know, they, they start to pile up. If you don't change who you are, you're going to continue to get the consequences. And I think a lot of people don't ever think they're going to continue to get more consequences. And that's the reality of it. If you, if you do not make a, a change on the inside of yourself, because this professional life that we live in, and when you're living it at the highest level, you can do just about whatever you want to do. And that's just the way it is. Well, you still had a strong year that year. You were third in MVP voting. But then at the end of the year, you became a free agent and you ended up joining the Dodgers. Uh, why not stay with the Mets? considering how well you did up to that point? Well, because I didn't really have a relationship with the front office anymore at that time. And, and they led me into like having a bitter taste going into my free agency year and say, well, prove, prove yourself. That's, what, that's basically what they were saying to me. So I said, okay, well, 
that's kind of, you know, what happens a lot of times when, when a player, elite player is about to go into that free agency and you tell him to prove himself. You know, I, I proved myself just the same as what happened to Aaron Judge with the Yankees. He went into his last year. They said, well, prove yourself to us. What? <laughs> there you go. You know, you, you're in a situation where you have to, you, you, put it in, you put it in the player's hand to show me that you're still, you know, still at the top of your game. And I did that year, 1990. Went out with a bang and I said goodbye. You know, I went on moving and, and, and left New York. You know, I never thought I would leave New York, but I did. Well, right, because when you signed with the Dodgers, you had a five-year, $22.25 million contract, which at the time was huge. I mean, these days, that's not considered huge. But <laughs> at that time, you know, because baseball has gotten gigantic these days. But at the time, that was a major, major deal. And, you know, that next year in 91, I mean, you had a, you had a strong year. I mean, in fact, you actually hit 280 lifetime homers by age 29, and people were comparing you to Hank Aaron and so forth. Well, what happened was that year was, yeah, I signed with the Dodgers, and it was my first season. And I really never missed a lot of games, you know, in my career. So that first year I make a play, I go make a play in the outfield, and I run into the wall and dislocate my shoulder. The next day they had the wall padded up. I was like, well, you're a day too late. Because <laughs> Dodger <laughs> Stadium had never had padding on the wall until I ran into the wall that day and dislocated my shoulder. So they had to pad, put the padding on the wall. But it was too late. You know, I had already messed my shoulder up and I was out. I'm, people don't realize I missed that first half of the season. You know, I didn't, I didn't play because I had a bad shoulder. I mean, dislocated shoulder. You can't play. It was my throwing shoulder, you know, that I dislocated and everything. So I could not play for a, a, a length of time and everything. And, and, and when I did come back, I came back in, I came back with just a fire in me. And, and, and the second half of that season, I just completely tore it up. I, I took it out on every pitcher that I was facing that second half of that season. Well, by that next year though, 92, things took kind of a, a downward spiral. Yes. And you had problems with alcohol, but then drugs started to play at this point. And you actually talked about in the book how you started doing crack around that time? Not that, well, I got introduced to it in LA. You know, Hollywood, you know, the scenery of parties and stuff like that. You get introduced to all the drugs and stuff. And I got up, I end up in all the wrong places. Let me just say this, you know, going, LA, LA was home for me, you know, and, 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 and it was never anything personal about, you know, playing for the Dodgers or anything like that. People don't, people don't understand you know, when a, when a player and a person comes in his own background, I know every back street of L.A. So I start hitting all the wrong streets and all the wrong places and, get, and getting around all the wrong people. And, you know, life is really about people, places, and things, especially when you live in California. You know, California life is different. You know, Hollywood is different. Those parties and girls and, you know, you get, you, you get in the middle of those, you're going to get tied up into some things. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I live in L.A., man. I, I can relate. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You, gonna, I, I know what you're talking. I mean, about. I, that was home for me. Like I said, I, I knew every back road, and I knew, I knew where not to go and what not to do. But you know, I started going into places like these, these different places up in the Hollywood Hills and stuff like that, and and and, and kind of, you know, meeting around the wrong group of people instead of staying in my lane, in which I always said I would never get entangled with celebrity lifestyles. You know, because that that's a lot of confusion. Two celebrities bumping heads and there's a lot of egos and there's a lot of stuff goes on. And then you get bumped into the life of the parties, the girls, the drugs, the scene. And man, once you're in it, you're in it. You can't get out of it. Yeah. And that kind of set off a chain of events because, you know, that next year you were finalizing your divorce. So you had to write these big checks and... At that point, you started having health problems because at one point you, you were playing against the Phillies and you, you couldn't get up. You were having back problems. So your future in baseball was uncertain. The divorce was finalized and you had to actually cut all these huge checks. You know, there was the depression of knowing that just like your dad, you're not going to be home, you know, growing up with your kids. And, you know, I'm sure it kind of created a bit of a cycle between the drugs, the alcohol, the depression, you know, the inability to play and so forth. 
It did, you know, and I think what happened is it's the womanizing more than anything uh, uh, that, that gets, gets you in all of this trouble. Because you ain't just out there chasing the drugs, you're chasing the women and the drugs. You know, they run hand in hand, you know, and run together. And when you run together with that, eventually it's going to catch up to you. You know, and I, you know, you talk about I, I came around Philly on a wet night and I scored. And all of a sudden I went back to the dugout, I couldn't get up. You know, my back went out. Come to find out I, I had a slip disc, you know, cause, but that's what starts to happen. You know, the wear and tear on the body you know, starts to happen when you get close to 30 because um, you played for so long. It's a lot of wear and tear. You know, the doctor said you're going to have all type of injuries start to, to flare up, you know, uh, knee injuries, ankles and shoulders, back and all that. And then the life that you're out there running starts to pile up on you, too. Um, the women started to pile up, you know, the drugs and the women, you know, sleeping around, never getting rest. Now your body's starting to go this way, you know, and now, you, now you're, in, you're in need of something. You're in need of some kind of pickup. So now you get involved with the amphetamines. You know, I started taking amphetamines to play every night. You know, people goes, well, what does amphetamines do for you? They make your eyes this big and make the ball this big coming into the plate, you know. When you're playing, people don't know it's been around baseball forever. And I wasn't the only one. You know, many players have, have taken amphetamines to you because it made us very successful. But what happens, starts to happen with the amphetamines is they start to not work as well as they did from the beginning because now you need more. Now, all of a sudden, I'm instead of, instead of taking, taking four, I'm taking four at BP and I'm taking another four, you know, as the game get ready to kick in. So, you know, you, there you are. Now you up all night, you wired all night, you up. Now you got to come down. I got to drink milk. You know, I got, I, I got to do this. I got to do that. And, and it just keeps you going. It keeps you going out at night and you're drinking and you're mixing everything together. And then kaboom, you know, it just all come crashing down. It comes crashing down on you physically, mentally, emotionally. Well, after you retired, you actually said that you had a sex addiction to the point where you would have sex between innings. I mean, that was just a couple of times in different ballparks, you know. Uh, how do you how do you pull that off between innings? Uh, just, yeah, you're not you're not you're not batting, you know. That was only in Chicago, you know. You're not batting. Okay. You, know? you just have a girl in the stash somewhere, like you know. <laughs> that was somewhere. listen. We we're talking about playing in the eighties, eighties, nineties. It was different. Girls are everywhere. You know, girls are just open to all kinds of things. Um, mm. That's why, you know, as a player of today, you got to be extremely careful, you know, because if something happens, you could lose your career because of, you know, Internet and social media and they have all those different outlets. We didn't have all those outlets. So it was really easy to do some things that we were doing. You know, baseball players and athletes in period, you know, we have an animal style in us, you know. It's, it's, it's nothing like really personal that we take against anybody but you know I, I just think girls girls are beautiful and you know when I when I was playing back in those days and those opportunities were just always there you know and, and sometimes you was in a different ballpark and it was an opportunity there you make a split decision <laughs> <laughs> but I need to get back on the field okay we only got five minutes so let's make it work <laughs> okay well um Around that time, you and Doc Gooden, you would be sent to all types of events where you would sign autographs, take pictures, everything else like that, and you'd get paid ten thousand here, fifteen thousand there, and you had a team of accountants and, and lawyers and so forth that was supposed to handle everything. And then out of nowhere, the IRS showed up and said that you owe three hundred thousand dollars because a lot of these appearances weren't paying, were you know, you actually weren't declaring them and paying taxes on them. And you talked about in your book, which was crazy to me, is you guys were making so much money that you would ride home. You and Doc Gooden would just throw $100 bills out the window just to do it. <laughs> we did. We were giving it to kids in those neighborhoods. Uh, huh. I mean, because we were making so much money, you know, cash, you know, doing appearances, 15000 12000 cash. And um, nobody was ever talking about it. Everybody was doing it at that time. And, and what happened was, they got a window to IRS and they got my statements and, and other p player statements. And they called me and they said, well, you're the ring leader. I said, I'm not the ring leader. I said, I'm just one of the guys that we're, we're getting cast like everybody else was. Well, they said, well, why don't you tell us about everybody? 
Tell us about Eric Davis. Tell us about Hoka Kaseko, Ricky Henderson. I said, I don't know nothing about them. I know I got 12,000 cats. They said, well, if you don't rat on everybody else, you're going to take the fall. I said, well, I'm just going to have to take the fall because I'm not ratting on nobody. You're not getting anything out of me. So they indicted me, and I took the fall. I was not going to be a rat, I could tell you that. Uh, like most players went in there singing a song to the IRS. Well, it's Gerald Strawberry, he's the star. You know, and I come back, I come in and they tell me, well, this guy said this, this guy said that. And I says, they said, what do you have to say about it? I said, I have nothing to say. And they say, well, you will be indicted. I said, well, I just have to be indicted because I'm not saying anything about anybody because I say I don't know anything about anybody's business and I don't care about them. I'm going to tell you what I did. And then if you want to indict me on that, then so be it. And that's what happened. They ended up indicting me on, on, on that. Um, the IRS ended, ended up indicting me for 300000 um, not not paying taxes on. So I had to go through that process. And I went through it because, you know, it was either me or what I'd lay over and tell on people. And I just, I just, I won't do that. I come from where I came from, South Central LA. You just don't do that. That's, that's just a no-no, no matter what. I don't care what it looks like. It's just a no-no. Right. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, because in 1996, at 34 years old, the Yankees win the World Series with you on the team. And then in 1998, the Yankees win the World Series again with you on the team. I mean, how does it feel to have two more two more rings, you know, age 34, 36, considering everything you had gone through? Sorry. Go considering no. everything you had gone through. Well, I, I, I thought it was really cool because I, I got a chance to laugh at a lot of reporters that said I couldn't play anymore and it was so funny because that's what they were saying when George's boss was thinking about bringing me back to the Yankees they was like well he can't play he can't catch up with fastballs he can't hit major league pitching anymore and a lot of these guys that I, and some of the media that I knew from my early days when I played over in Queens and um, they would always have a reason to be negative towards you you know because you have you know fallen short in life uh, it, it's, I'm just a baseball player. I'm still a person somewhere underneath there, you know. And they were talking about my baseball skills. So I laughed about it because I knew my baseball skills had not diminished. You know, and I knew I could just get up and get going. And and, and once I got up and, and done that and showed them that, I didn't have to say anything. Um, it, my performance on the field spoke for itself. Because a lot of times they thought I wasn't go, wasn't going to play. But they were wrong about it because Joe Torrey, he had more faith in me than they could ever imagine. And he always told me, I'm not worried about what anybody say about you. I know you can play and you're going to play. And, and, and that's what I kind of kept quiet about and just went out there and played and did my thing. And everything, everything took care of itself from there. Well, I mean, here you are with the Yankees. You just won a World Series. But then on October 1st, 1989, you get diagnosed with colon cancer. A relatively young man, 36 years old. How does how does someone in your position really get their head around such a such a horrible diagnosis? 1998, I played. I played that whole year, and that was a good year for me with the Yankees. Um, little did I know I had a tumor inside of me the whole year of playing. I knew something was wrong as the season was going because I started to lose weight, and I had blood in my stool all the time. And I wouldn't say anything about it. I would go to the ballpark and I would drink Maalox every day. Um, I'm an athlete, you know. If, it, if if my arms not cut off and my my knees, I didn't blow my knee out. I won't be all right, you know. That's the way we think. And and I was playing and losing weight, and then I went to the trainer at the end of the season in September, and I said, I got a lot of blood in my stool, and you know, I've been dropping weight. Uh, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, let's get you into the doctor after the end of the season, the last game of the season. So we waited till the last game of the season so, uh, that year. And then I went in and I went in to see the doctor and they ran the test on me. And there it was, they found a tumor in my colon. And, um, and I was completely shocked because my mother died at the age of 55 from terminal breast cancer. So I was deeply worried, you know, here it is. I'm young, um, 36 years old. And here it is. I'm, got a tumor and got cancer in me, you know, and going to find out, you know, that I was going to have to go through a major surgery uh, to, to, to have that done. And I couldn't go 
the team was going into the playoffs, and I was supposed to be going with the team into the playoffs and after having a good year, come to find out I wouldn't be able to make it in the playoffs and in the series that year because I was going to have a surgery, a major surgery, which I did. I went in and had the surgery, and it's like a seven-hour surgery, something they did on me uh, to remove that tumor uh, out of me. And um, they told me after I went through that whole process uh, that it was like colon cancer, and you have to be extremely careful because it could reoccur at any time, and you were in a five-year window that I had to go through. I had to go through a five-year window, and... You know, I was going through chemo, and I, I mean, I just hated it. I, I just wanted to be dead, you know, from the fact of going through chemo and, and dealing with all that over that all season to try to get back and fight, get back in uniform. Well, yeah, I mean, as you're going through, you know, the chemo and trying to come back from it, uh, you know, you played a little bit, and then, you know, the Yankees won another World Series. So, I mean, you're still technically with the team, so that's another ring. That's your that's your fourth <laughs> ring at that point, right? Fourth ring in the yeah, in big leagues. Four years, you know, guys play their whole career and don't get one. You know, here there's yeah. uh, the opportunity to play with great teams. Um, and all in New York, you know, all the guys in New York, those teams that I played with were in New York at the time. And, you know, three with the Yankees and, and one with the Mets. And I was very fortunate to be able to be in the right place at the right time to experience that. You know, uh, but, you know, it's still a long, long road because – you know, I went through that 99 season and, and everything, and I mean, 98 season, and then 99 came, you know, and then, you know, I relapsed again, and then I was out, out of baseball for good. Then 2000, you know, the cancer reoccur inside of me, colon cancer, so that would be the second time. And I go in for my second surgery, and they have to remove my left kidney in my second surgery. So I had to go through that whole process of, so, you know, signing off on a release form that if they had to remove a kid, that kidney, because it was a healthy kidney, but it was a tumor right under the kidney. And so I had to go through that whole uh, process. I didn't want to go through that surgery again. I was telling the doctor, I can't do it. There's no way I could do it. I was just like, I'd just rather be dead. I don't want to go through another surgery, chemo and everything. And then my doctor convinced me. He said, this is not about you. You know, this is one time you're going to have to think this is not about you. He says, you got young kids that deserve a chance. He says, you can live with one kidney, but you got young kids that deserve a chance to have their father live and be here. And, you know, he really drilled that home to me. So I had to, I had to go through that process again. And it was, it was the most challenging time, the most difficult time of my life that I went through of uh, having that second surgery because I wasn't well after I got out of, you know, Got out, got out from the second surgery and uh, one kidney operating. And there it was, they prescribed me with Percocets and, and, I, and I started taking those and I got addicted to those and couldn't get off of those, you know, and that was another hard, challenging uh, moment of my life, you know, facing that uh, and, you know, just going through so many different things, you know, violating probation. So I would end up from there, you know, Kept going to treatment and violating treatment and probation. And I just, then I just remember standing in front of the judge, Judge Foster. Um, and she was, because after violating probation, she had me in front of her and I was sick and I wouldn't take chemo. And I, she said, well, what do you think I should do to you, with you? I said, I don't care what you do. I just rather die. I'm not taking chemo no more or none of that. And she said, well, you're just going to go back over there in the county jail and you're going to sit. And she sat me over there for like two months. Uh, without even hearing from her. And she got sick and came off the bench. Then another judge came in and he, I came back in front of him with my attorney. And my attorney said, well, what do you want to do? You know, after violating treatment and getting kicked out of there, he says, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to prison. You know? And he says, really? I said, yeah. I said, I don't want no more paper. I don't want to do no more uh, probation. And I said, how much time I'm going to do on the 18 months since? He says, 12 months. I said, I'll, get, I'll take the 12 months, send me to prison. You know, and there it was. I made a decision to go to prison and be locked up. And so I didn't want to do any more. I didn't want to be on DOC anymore. I didn't want them having control of me because they were just like the system is really so wicked the way they treat people. And, you know, they don't, you know, because the judge Foster looked at me as like he's not a miss to society. He has a drug problem. 
It, it, you know, he does. He, he's not a criminal. And you know, the state trying to tell him he's a criminal. He's this, and she goes, he's not a criminal. He, he, where's the crime at? He hasn't done a crime. He has a drug problem. He, he's a very sick man. He needs help. And so, and I ended up, you know, going to do the 12 months, and that was it. Well, yeah, because around that time, that's when everything kind of seemed to crumble for you. Because in April 3rd, 99, you got arrested in Tampa for soliciting an undercover female cop. They found a little bit of cocaine on you. So you got suspended for 140 days from Major League Baseball. And you're supposed to come back to the Yankees in 2000, but then you tested positive for cocaine during spring training. So the Yankees let you go, and that essentially ended your baseball career. When you knew that your baseball career was over after playing at the highest level, four rings, superstar, everything that comes with it, how did you really feel? I was the best thing probably ever happened at that point in time. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it, huh. it, there was nowhere else to go. You know, I, I had done everything in baseball. I had accomplished everything you could want to accomplish in baseball in, in a career. Um, so I was pretty much satisfied with that. And it was like, what's next? It's got to be something else. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of athletes could never take the uniform off. Mm. And I knew I needed to take the uniform off at some point in some time. But I hadn't really taken it off at that time and even through the struggles that I went through. Uh, being out of baseball and moving on and moving forward. You know, I was still, I was still straddling the fence with the uniform, identifying myself. And that's what I'm saying, identifying myself as Darryl Strawberry, the baseball player, Major League Baseball uniform and all these teams. And so many athletes will go through that their entire life and can never get free from that. And I needed to get free from that. I just didn't know how and when. And I was just trying to figure out and hoping that one day that I would truly get f free from the uniform. And I would never have to you know, look back and, and identify myself as this. And, and that was going to be a process. And, and it was a process. It was a long process after all those years, going to prison and coming out, getting out, losing my next marriage. And then, and then Tracy coming into my life and she was in, uh, she was in recovery and we met in recovery at a, at a convention, uh, Narcotics Anonymous convention in, in, in South Florida. And literally I know because I was struggling. She had one year clean and I had five seconds clean. I had just come back from a binge, <laughs> you know, out there smoking crack, shooting dope and, and wanting life to be over and um, still wasn't done. And, you know, I would end up hooking up with her. And I said, well, you know, because I was asking, I said, God, well, if there's a sign, send me something, send me a hope in a light. And it was her and I didn't even know it at the time. And then I would take her through this whole process too with me. I told her you when we first met, I said, you don't want to get involved with me because I run through people like a tornado. <laughs> I'm nothing nice, you know, and I, because I was very sick in my addiction and stuff like that. And, and me and her ended up getting together and, and going on this journey together. And, and she would be, she would be that light that was sent to me to help me and to shape me and mold me. And it was just, it was, it was totally incredible, you know, because we all, a lot of times, as people, we think it's really about us, and it's really not about us, but we think it is, you know, and it's really not about us. It's about what can be done through us, and I didn't know all that at the time, so me and her go on this journey, and I took her through it, and, and we had to break up and didn't know if we were going to ever be together because I was still in the midst of my addiction, and she was well, and she was trying to move forward in her faith and on a new journey, and I had to go, and I had to go back and research, and I had to do some real research on myself and re-examine myself. And, and I did that because you got to do the work if you want to get well. And a lot of times, a lot of people don't. They want to use every excuse. You know, I want to use the uniform as my excuse, what I used to do. And I realized that that was no longer a part of who I was. Well, yeah, I remember when I interviewed Mike Tyson, uh, he said something that still rings in my head to this day. He said, it takes a woman to make you feel like a man. No deleting that we have made for. For we can for we can know that we're men. Yeah. The only reason we can know that we're men is that we have a woman. Yeah. Other than that, we can't we can't justify for being a man. So yeah. they justify us for being who we are. And people really 
they don't understand, you know, heterosexual men just don't understand how important having the right woman is in your life. It could completely transform every asset of your being. But it's got to be a good woman. Exactly. You know, it can't just be anyone. It's got to right. be, it's got to be one that lines up with some real principles um, mm -hmm. that live a different way, Those doesn't live for, you know, the worldly perspective of I got to have all this, I got to have all that. Because when I met Tracy, she was different than any woman I ever met. She, she wasn't, she wasn't a Gucci bag or Louis Vuitton. You know, she took me shopping at Walmart. I was like, what is Walmart? She's like, this, <laughs> she's like, this is where you need to shop. You need, you need to buy socks, you need to buy shoes, whatever you need to get, because you need to get past all that other stuff. And, and that was really eye-opening to me. That really, that really hit me, because now I realize that she wasn't, she wasn't a woman that was tagged to things, you know, being also, I was like, well, why are you so different? She goes, well, I'm born in the Midwest. And this is just the way we live in the Midwest. You know, we don't, we don't have to, we don't try to live any fancy lifestyle. You know, you've been in New York and LA and all these high big cities, you know, where everything has just been so fancy and stuff like that. But when you live in the Midwest, we're more like family and we live different. And, and I was like, wow, you know, cause I had never experienced that. And that's what really, really made me follow the road that she was going on because it was different. I mean, you end up doing 11 months in prison during that one stretch. And, and prison is a very, a very harsh place. What was the worst thing you think you experienced while being locked up, especially you being Daryl Strawberry, the baseball star, you know, surrounded by people who, you know, come from the worst parts of society? <laughs> It was very easy for me because I, I came from that. You're growing up in South Central, people don't understand. Growing up in South Central LA, that's real. You know, the streets are real. You know, and the guys I grew up with are some of the same guys that end up going to prison. Now, if you end up, you know, constantly going to prison, which happened to a lot of those guys, uh, they just end up with a number all the time and nothing's ever changed on the inside. So I was like not I was like not in fear of of going in there. You know, I mean I grew up in the hood. The most you're gonna do is be have to go through is you're gonna have to scrap with somebody. If, if that's what you have to do. You know, I was used to that because every time one of those pitchers hit me on the mound, I charged the mound and whooped the crap out of them. So <laughs> I, I was used to it. In, I was used to it anyway in baseballs. So it wasn't like I was right. walking like I'm going to prison, I'm, I'm scared. I just remember going into the prison and going into the central place in Orlando. And I remember the captain who's running the prison and what he told me was so profound. And he says, he says, you don't belong in here. He says, do your time and don't come back. And that stuck with me. Cause he said, you don't belong in here. He said, you know, it's not looking at you as being better or in, any different than somebody else. You made some mistakes. Okay. You never harmed anybody. You only harmed yourself, but he was basically telling me, just do your time and be, be done with it. And, and he was right. You know, he was so right for telling me that because that's what I was looking at. You know, I was looking at doing my time and being, being who I was, you know, and I had a lot of fun, you know, I mean, there's activities, you get to play sports and you get to smoke cigarettes and, you know, you know, it's just like anything else, you know, it's like, it's like if you, if you keep yourself together and clean and, and stay out of other people's way, um, don't be boasting about anything while you're there, nobody's going to sweat you there, you know, I mean, it, everybody, everybody in the prison I went to was a low camp anyway. And had a, it was a treatment facility and everybody was cool there. You know, everybody's trying to recover from something, you know, because everybody wanted, a lot of guys had done a lot of time and they got different letters and they've been in and out. It's been a revolving door, you know, of 10 years of trafficking and this and that stuff. So a lot of guys go to those camps. They want to be in those camps where it's, you know, not a lot of violence. And because when you're on the major yard somewhere and you get in one of those big penitentiaries, which I go into all the time now, but I get to come out you know, cause I go in and do some ministry, but I'm saying it's, 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 a, it's a different place. And so 
I never really thought about, you know, being afraid of guys uh, when I was there. And, and what nothing really crazy happened. Did somebody try me a few times? Yeah, you know. Of course somebody was going to try, you know, and see, but I was the wrong one. You just don't walk up. You know, I was like, it was like, man, that dude is tough, man. <laughs> We're thinking of him as a baseball player, but, man, he'd be, he's ready to throw down in a heartbeat. And, mm. and when guys see that, they know that. They pull back from that. Well, I mean, after you get out, you're no longer a professional baseball player, but baseball still embraced you. Uh, you were an instructor for the New York Mets in 2005 and 2008. Uh, you attended the, the Mets 86 World Champion uh, Championship Team Reunion in 2006. And then in 2010, you were inducted into the Mets Hall of Fame. How did that feel? Felt great. You know, I, I came back, came full circle, went back around baseball for a minute and um, enjoyed it, did some TV. Um, and then I just really, I think what really happened was, was with, with my wife, Tracy, she says, when are you going to take that uniform off for real? Um, you know, after going through that whole process of all that, that, that was a very, really defining moment in my life when she asked me, what I, you need to take that uniform off, you know. And, and she was right. It was good at the time. I thought I was doing good, but she thought, no, that's not the life that you're supposed to have. You know, you're supposed to be over the uniform. You're supposed to be away. Nothing going back to the reunions, nothing going back and having yourself inducted to the Mets Hall of Fame. All that's good. We celebrate that, but she... She was happy for me, but she said, you still got to take that uniform off. You got to get moving. There's a different direction, different purpose for your life. And she was right. You know, and that's why we talk about having a good woman in your corner to be able to back mm -hmm. you and keep pushing you forward. My wife kept pushing me forward, just like my mother kept believing that I would go on this journey and become this man that she always believed I would be. So my wife felt the same way, and, and, and I I started to really look at that and really, look, really evaluate that real hard and, and say, you know, because yeah, I could have kept going. Yeah, I could have kept going being a TV analyst, analyst and all these different things like a lot of other sports. But it, she just felt like it was something bigger for me to do. And I needed to do it before this life was over. You know, I had already been to the top of the mountain. Nobody's there. You, you, you get up there and you're up there by yourself. You got a bunch of. You got you you become a fool because you're at the top of the mountain and you got a bunch of fools running with you. So where are you going? <laughs> you know, because th this is all it is with, with people that run with people who who have had success because they have never had that like them. But as you notice for yourself, when you get up there, there's really nothing else up here. You know, where's the reality? Where's your real life? You know, we 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 lose our family because of playing sports. We won't walk away, you'll lose your family. And then you all alone again in the wilderness by yourself. Now you're still chasing and the girls are still chasing after you. And it just had to be more to life than that. And my wife wanted me to be able to see that. And after those years of, of coming back and, and doing all that with baseball and, and being around it, she was right. I, had, I, I pulled myself out of it, I, I had to. I had to take a different journey. Well, yeah, speaking of family, in 2007, your son, Daryl Strawberry Jr., a.k.a. DJ, was actually drafted by the Phoenix Suns. So although he didn't follow you in baseball, he did follow you in professional sports. How did that feel to have... That, that's your oldest son, right? That's my oldest son, DJ, yes. Yeah, so DJ, your oldest son, how did it feel for him to become a professional athlete as well? It felt great, but I never wanted any of my kids to ever be in professional sports. Hmm. I didn't say a whole lot about it, but I had already experienced it in my whole life. And I really didn't want them to experience that and go into that life. And my hope was that they would never get consumed with that lifestyle and get lost in it. I mean, I wanted them to do well. All my kids went to D1 college, played sports. My girls, my boys, DJ played at Maryland basketball. Jordan played at Mercer in Macon, Georgia, D1 basketball. Um, they had great careers. They got degrees, something I never did. I didn't go to D1 school. Um, they got an education in college. I didn't, and they said, what? I told my kids I got an education from the sidewalk, sidewalk university, from the streets. 
That was my education. So I didn't want them to get the education that I got. I wanted them to get a better education. So uh, I was really excited the fact that he did play and get drafted by Phoenix, play with the Suns, and then he went over to European basketball for many years and played over there for about 15 years or so. So I was happy mm. that because he played, he got into that spotlight a little bit and and I knew what what it would be about. It would be about girls, nightclubs, drinking, and, you know, out living the life. And um, he did a little bit of that, and then he just checked out and went on over to overseas. And, and I, that probably was the best decision for him. You wasn't going to make overseas, make much as money you would in the NBAs, but there was a life in that lifestyle that was different. And it's no different than a baseball lifestyle, football lifestyle. It's the same lifestyle. And I didn't want him to have to experience that. Well, in 2010, he showed up on Donald Trump's uh, Celebrity Apprentice with uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brett Michaels, Sharon Osbourne, Cindy Lauper, and of course, Donald Trump. <laughs> now, this is way before he was president. Wow. So did you, did you get to know Trump during that time at all? I knew Trump from my days in New York before he was even oh, was president. Oh, okay. You know? I mean, any, he's a, any interesting Trump stories? You know, he's a, he's a, he was to... just a big guy, big guy in New York City. Um, I mean, he went to all the sporting events. Everybody loved him when, when he was not before president. You know, he was Donald Trump. You know, he was Celebrity Apprentice. He was, you know, he was everything. I mean, because he, he you remember, I mean, when they first started that new football league uh, with Herschel Walker, and them, he was part yeah, of that. U USFL. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and he, he, I think he was the first one to sign Herschel Walker to a million dollars. You know, right. so we we know him from I'm, those are the days I I knew him from and everything. And and then I got invited to be on the show, and my wife didn't really want me to go on the show. You know, but I I knew one of his guys that was a part of his organization and ran his golf course all over the country, you know, because I used to play on this golf courses. So um, that's what happened. He asked, he says, well, Trump wants you to be on the show. And so I was like, okay, I got on it. And I was like, wow, you know, because I was on the journey. That's when I was on the journey of going in a different direction. And my wife was really, she was really upset that day, you know, that I would go on the show. She let me go on it, but she never got in the way, but she wasn't really happy about it. And, and I did go on the show and it, 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 was, it was pretty interesting, you know. Well, uh, speaking of Trump, in 2020, you had an interview uh, with Aaron Elmore, and she asked you what you thought of Kaepernick and the whole kneeling thing. And it, it was a bit of a loaded question, but uh, basically she said, what would you tell these athletes today who are playing politics with their job when their job is sports? And you said, I would tell them, really leave the politics alone as far as your job. You go out and do your job and play sports because you really have a one-time window open to play sports and have an impact on sports that's going to pass away. But what legacy do you leave in life? And that's the most important thing. And, and a lot of people kind of interpreted that as like a shut up and dribble kind of answer. But I didn't really see it as that. But but there was a backlash. I mean, when you think about that question, how do you feel about it now? I mean, I, I still stand on what I said because I know it's only a certain window of time. You know, and you can make one, one decision you know, in front of everybody, and it could cost you your career. And people don't understand that. And they thought, you know, yeah, I was like, yeah, well, you don't know what you're talking about. But see, look what happened to him. You know, his, his career. Yeah, yeah he, he never he never played again. Never played again. Because they're going to cut you out of it. You know, they, they, have, they have all the authority to run the sports. And, you know, the owners, uh, they run sports. Not, not players, not fans. It's the owners that run that business. You know, and it's and it's up to them. They, they it's a yes or no with them if they don't want you. And players don't understand that career. Your career is only this long, and then that day come you got to retire. And when you retire, who are you? You think about it. Most players that will play, if you wasn't a superstar, most of the time you're not getting invited back. It's only the guys that have been superstars for the organization that they bring back for, you know, certain things in their careers. Why? Because they had such a great impact on what the organization was all about. And, you know, everybody was screaming and kicking and saying, well, he don't know what he's talking about. He's this and that. Listen, I've been there. I played there. I played at the highest level. You guys, a lot of them don't know what they're talking about. 
You know, you're outsiders making noise. And I knew for him and him being the football player he was that they were going to hold that against him. And I knew the fact that he would probably never get a job again, you know, because of the, the fact everybody's saying, well, he was just uh, he was just a quarterback. He was you know, he wasn't he wasn't what like Mahomes or, you know, Lamar Jackson, these guys that are standing today, you know, that that, that have a voice and, and a platform where they could say something and, and, and nobody can hold it against them. You can't hold that against a guy like LeBron James because he has created his own platform of his uh, of his great success for who he is. But if you're just a player and you haven't made it up to that level and you do something like that, they're going to they're gonna run you right out of here. So I, I, I tried to say that in a way, in, in a way that people – would see it, but they didn't want to see it that way. They thought I didn't really know what I was talking about. But at the end of the day, what happened? Right, right. And, you know, before you actually start playing professional sports, there was the whole 68 Olympics thing that happened with Tommy Smith and John Carlos, where they, they raised the, the fist, you know, when they were winning their medals. And they took a lot of backlash. So it just seemed like over the next 20 years, during the time you were playing, no one really made a lot of noise in professional sports. No one really protested or spoke out against, you know, they pretty much did the game and played quiet until what happened with Kaepernick a few years ago. Well, I think a lot of times people don't, if you don't understand the national anthem, you don't understand what the flag is for and the freedom that the people have fought for you to have the freedom to live here and be here and go and play professional sports, then you don't understand. If you don't understand what that that's all about, you know, that, you know, I mean, I get it, I understand. That that wasn't the thing to be protesting about. We needed to be protesting about something totally different than that. We needed to be protesting about the brutality of police on the streets. That's what they should, everybody should have been rallying around protesting. And it, it had nothing to do with us standing up and, you know, I, I mean, I heard that song so many times, I would never miss it. You know, when it, when that song is being played and you you got a baseball uniform, football, basketball uniform on, you will stand to that because you honor that. You honor for what, you know, the flag means to you because somebody has made a way for us to be able to stand here and be on this field, putting this uniform in our, and having our safety to play a game of baseball. Well, the Mets announced that they're going to be retiring your number, number 18. That has that actually happened yet or no? Yes, it's June first this year. June first. Okay, that's what I thought. So even though you've taken your uniform off and left baseball in the rear view, how does it feel to know that your number is being retired by the team that you started with? Well, I, I think it's a really significant moment for me and you know the coaches that had an impact on my life, um, for my wife and my kids. Um, that I was able to overcome, you know, you could, you can easily sit in the victim mentality about life, but I don't want to sit there because my mother raised me and she raised me right. And I don't ever want to say I'm a victim. I don't want to say I'm an overcomer and I want to live with that. And I want to ride with that. I want to ride off into the sunset of my life, you know, when it's over uh, and said and done, but I was an overcomer. I never wanted to sit and say these things held me back because I, I look at life like this, you know, n no one will come here and have a perfect life. So if somebody tell you they do have a perfect life, I would tell you to run and run fast because they lying. <laughs> because there are gonna be some trials and tribulations. Um, it didn't never say it would not be some trials and tribulations. It said things will never prosper over you. You know, didn't say it wouldn't form, and things will form against you, but they will not prosper over you. And things have formed against my life, but they never prospered over me because I didn't allow them to take over me. Some people end up allowing them to take over them because they, they, they dwell on what everybody else think and say, but I don't reflect on what everybody else say and think. I reflect on where I came from, and I, I know where I came from. And where I came from, I had to, you had to either make a decision to get out of there or you want to stay there. And I don't want to, I, I, it's the same thing in life. You can make a decision to stay there or you need to get up. So I was able to get up in life and, and become someone new in life. And I think it's just such a great honor that, you know, the Mets have come to that place with the new ownership uh, to recognize in my career, the start of my career there in those eight years I played there. 
and that they would honor me and they would retire my jersey and say, well, no one will ever wear number 18 again for this organization because of what you have done for this organization. You've done so much. You, uh, you had adversities. You went through them and you didn't give up. You know, even during the days of playing the field, you never quit. You never gave up. And so I want to be able to celebrate that and, and say thank you. You know, so thank you to the fans because had it not been for the fans coming in to cheer you, to boo you, whatever it may be, it's all part of it. I learned to live with it. And it was a great part and it was a great feeling. And so it's one of the highest honors in sports. I think a lot of people don't understand. Uh, everybody don't get their number retired. A lot of guys will go to the Hall of Fame in their different sports, but only certain select will have their number retired where they hang, hang it up in the stadium and say, nobody's going to ever put this uniform on again. And, and I'm, getting, I'm getting to be that person come June 1st this year. Yeah, man. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. Looking forward to it. You've gone through a lot of addiction issues that we've talked about, starting with alcohol, leading to, to cocaine, crack, shooting up heroin, doing all various types of pills. But now you're completely sober. And a lot of people who are watching this right now are trying to figure out how to get sober mm -hmm. because the majority of their life has been similar to yours. So to those people who are listening right now, what would you tell them? Because you've been sober now for 20-something years. Yeah, over 20-something years. My wife, I think she's got about 23, 24 years. Um, and and of course, it's just one day at a time that a person has to learn how to live. But also, you have to remember, and I tell people all this all the time. It's a stigma where people talk about people in the drug addiction and talk about their weak. There's nothing weak about it. It's an illness. Um, and it's something that craves, you know, the body craves for. And it's not until one can get delivered. You know, you can't deliver yourself. And there's many, I tell people there's many pathways to recovery. You know, a lot of people go to, you know, AA, NA program, stuff like that, and treatment and all that, and all that's well, well and good for people, and they need that. But there's only one way to freedom, and you got to get free inside of yourself. You got to get spiritually unbound, you know, and I had, that's what had to happen to me. I had, I was spiritually bound by the addiction. It had a stronghold on my life, and it wasn't until I came into my relationship with Christ and got free on the inside, because the problem lies on the inside with us, the brokenness on the inside of us that never gets healed. And we try to heal it for ourselves. We try to heal it with money. We try to heal it with buying more stuff, clothes and everything else. And that doesn't work. All that do is put a patch on it like you put a Band-Aid on it. And it's not until you actually go in and have the real surgery on the inside of you where that brokenness lies on the inside of a person and you allow yourself to be healed on the inside from that and now you will be able to find the freedom and, and you will have the liberty to enjoy life to the fullest now because you no longer have this broken feeling inside of you about who you are. Now you know who you are. And, and that's what happened to me. I had a complete transformation over my life and I've been in faith for a long time and you know, standing and doing a lot of great things to help a lot of people. And I want to continue to do that till the end of my life. And you know, I, I, I credit my mother, I say, God's got a great sense of humor. He used two women to straighten me out. My mother praying for me and my wife pulling me out of dope houses <laughs> and leading me back into my faith to get me well. Well, Daryl Strawberry, man, uh, the kind of honesty that you've shown throughout this interview is very rare. And I've interviewed thousands of people. Uh, a lot of people that I interview always try to paint themselves in the best possible light. You know, they don't show all the bruises and dirt and everything else that they went through, but you've really embraced not only your victories, but also your losses along the way. And like you said, every person that you know or you don't know has been through a similar journey in their own way, but not everyone is honest enough to actually talk about it and admit it to themselves. And I think as you live in denial and think that you're, you're perfect and whatever issues you have is not really a big deal, you continue to bring pain not only to yourself, but all the people around you. So I really, you know, not only do I appreciate the the triumphs and the World Series and the playoffs and, you know, the, the all-star games and everything else like that, but to talk about all the downfalls and how you managed to actually turn yourself around and, and to know that for a third of your life, you've been completely sober. Uh, I think that's very, very inspirational. And I think that really shows a lot of people that you could make a lot of bad decisions for decades and you could turn it around at any point, which is something that you've done. 
and I, I am extremely grateful for the conversation we just had. I've really internalized a lot of the stuff, you know, because I have my own set of problems as well, you know, and, um, you know, I'm really taking a lot of notes throughout. I really appreciate what you've shared with me today. Well, well, thanks for having me. You know, and like I said before, we, we, we all do. We all are human. And I didn't say, you know, Bible says some of us would fall short. They say we will all fall short. And falling short doesn't mean you can't get back up. That's the problem with so many people. And the problem that has happened to so many celebrities, why they've never been able to get back up, because everybody's always praised them about what they used to do. And then when the storm comes, they don't know how to get out of the storm. You know, and I, no different than any other celebrity, I, I had a lot of storms in my life. And when they came, I just didn't drown in it. Because if you drown and go under in the water, you're, you're done. If you stay above, you don't have to use excuses and you can clean yourself up regardless of what, what challenges you've had in life. It's just life. And, and then hopefully, you know, so many more see that. So many didn't have to die in addiction like so many of them that did die in addiction because nobody ever told them they had a problem. And they could, they can get well. That's my whole point here today with you is to show people that you can get well no matter what it may look like because I've been through it all and done it all. Well, yeah, and I feel that you actually got somewhat lucky because during the time that you were going through your drug issues, fentanyl wasn't around. Yeah. And I've, I've personally lost friends, like my friend Gangster Boo from 36 Mafia. She died from a fentanyl overdose last year. And I, I had just been hanging out with her a week before. And, and these days, people simply don't get a second chance because of what fentanyl is doing. You don't know what you're getting. You know, you're getting these street drugs and you have no idea. And before you know it, that's it. There's no second chance. You checked out and, and, and that's it. So, so you were luckily able to recover before what we're going through right now so you could actually tell the story. And hopefully a lot of people that are listening and millions of people will listen to this. I think they're really going to get a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom from what you're saying. So thank you so much. I wish you all the best. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. Yes, sir. Peace.